Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Co-host today is Daniel McAdams. Daniel, good to see you. Good to be with you, Dr. Paul. Good. We're going to have a very interesting program today. Oh, yeah. Two experts on internationalism, but the good kind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're not the globe. They travel the globe, but they're not globalists. <laughs> they will may talk about it. And that is uh, somebody I've known for a long time, Doug Casey. He is well known in the libertarian circles. He graduated from Georgetown, Georgetown University. I know Doug from back in the 70s and the 80s that uh, he would have some meetings up at uh, Aspen they, it, it called the Aris Society, and I got to know him from there. And he's also been well known for the books he's written, uh, and especially for uh, Crisis Investment, I think that's the name of one of his publications. Uh, he is known as the international man. <laughs> and uh, Doug, it's very nice to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Ron. I'm talking to you right now from Capajate, Argentina, where we have a, a, a development that we put together some years ago. And uh, as I speak to you, since this is, especially since the election of the new president, uh, this is a relatively free country, and I'm celebrating with a Cuban cigar. Oh, great. Wonderful. I also want to in, introduce an associate of yours that you work with uh, quite uh, often, and that's Nick Giabruno. Uh, he's with us today, not in the same place that you are, but I think in the same country. And Nick, it's good to have you with us. Uh, he's the editor of the internationalman.com. Uh, Nick, good to see you. Ah, thanks for having me, Dr. Paul. Good. Okay, Doug, um, now that you're smoking Cuban cigars and that uh, the world is living in peace uh, with Cuba once again, uh, I, I just wonder uh, whether that's a good sign that we're moving in the right direction, that internationalism of the bad kind has, has failed and the globalism is done with. And what, what are you anticipating, uh, especially with this recent election? Is the uh, nation state going to be undermined? And have we ushered in a new era that we can all sit back and enjoy uh, and smoke a cigar? Well, I wish, I wish I could say that was the case with some certainty, but, um, you know, the, the whole world is continuing to go in the wrong direction with um, all their financial controls and border controls and uh, remilitarization and lots of wars and this type of thing going on. Um, so that's the bad news, but the good news is that the common man seems to be revolting, uh, as evidenced by the election of Donald Trump in the U.S. and Mauricio Macri here in Argentina, and uh, the fact that uh, Dilma in Brazil is, is being indicted. And it seems like all over Europe, the uh, non-establishment characters are uh, uh, going to win in the months to come. So I, I'm not sure what to make of it, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, was, <clears throat> I saw both of you gentlemen had a very interesting interview that you did together very recently in The International Man, I believe. And you sort of sketched out a kind of history timeline, which I found very interesting. You talked about how we began with tribes, then we moved into kingdoms, then came the nation state, which is sort of a geographic accident of birth. Uh, and then you say we're moving into a new era where we will have uh, a new sort of voluntary society that technology itself will lend itself to. Maybe if you could explain this timeline better, I think it would be very interesting. Well, let, let me speak to that, if I may. Um, yeah, that, that is the way. Those are the three great stages of political evolution in the world. And I'd like to believe that uh, Neil Stevenson was quite correct in his... Uh, absolutely stellar novel, Diamond Age, when he says that uh, the next evolution is going to be files, where people aren't loyal to some government just because they're born there, but they find their own countrymen, no matter where in the world they are, whether it's the Congo or France or Burma or the U.S., people that you share views with and philosophies with and uh, uh, see, uh, see life in the same way that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and these files uh, will become your new extended family, perhaps with millions of people. 
So I like to think that that's the next evolution, and it's enabled by the internet, which is the greatest invention since Gutenberg put together movable type. Nick, you, I think with the international man, you are part of, of, what, uh, of what Mr. Casey is talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about the publication, the e-publication, and what its purpose is and what role it plays? Oh, yes, absolutely. But I think first, it's important, uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, it's very important to distinguish between globalism, which is bad, and internationalism, which is not bad. And, uh, globalism simply means the centralization of power, uh, into global institutions like the United Nations, NATO, uh, NAFTA, FATCA, GATCA, and these kinds of things. They're not good things. It's the centralization of power uh, on a global basis, and I think that centralization of power is always bad. Uh, internationalism, or how I would define it, is a little bit different. It's about uh, people spreading different aspects of their life uh, around different countries in the world, and the reason you would do this is not to centralize power, but to divorce yourself uh, as much as you can from uh, the politicians and bureaucrats in any particular country. So this might mean getting uh, multiple citizenships, multiple passports, and that's particularly handy because uh, any government can really revoke your passport or your citizenship basically for every any reason they want to. Uh, so they can put you on under house arrest. You can't travel without a passport. I don't. I don't like that we even need to travel with passports. But uh, fact of the matter is, is if they're, if you're going to need them, you might as well have a lot of them so that uh, your political risk is in a sense diversified. So really, internationalization and internationalism is really just about diversifying your political risk versus globalism, which is about centralization of power. So my publication. Uh, is actually has its roots in Doug's uh, first book, which has the same name, International Man, and uh, it's all about uh, doing exactly that and uh, removing as much political risk from your life as uh, you possibly can. And I think the best way to do that is with uh, internationalization. I want to follow up on that because I think that's a very interesting uh, distinction because, uh, you know, generally speaking, if you're against globalism, which I speak out against all the time, uh, some people interpret that, you know, at least uh, in a narrow sense, that that means protectionism and that you need to close in and it's nationalism, but they don't realize that the true uh, internationalism uh, doesn't require government, like you point out, uh, that uh, you don't need treaties, you don't need NAFTA, and you don't need the WTO, and that if you have a truly libertarian society where the borders are much more open, uh, it's, it's so different. So often in Washington, I was challenged, oh, you're an isolationist, you don't want to do this, you don't want to go to war. But, you know, it's the people who believe in globalism that are always putting on sanctions and, and looking for wars and putting pressure on them. So a lot of times, uh, you know, the people that look at this, uh, our enemies, will turn around and say, oh, you are a bunch of isolationists, and I work hard to try to s separate the two. There was a time that other libertarians used isolation isolationism as a, as a neat little term, uh, but they meant it they meant it to be a good term, but I never liked the word of isolationism to trying to define what I consider to be uh, a principle based on the non-aggression principle. Well, you're totally right, Dr. Paul, and it comes down to a battle of ideas, and really, it's not an honest, in my opinion, it's not an honest argument to be, to call somebody who is against globalism an isolationist. I mean, anybody who can uh, think clearly can clearly see that that's just a pejorative and is not a serious argument. Why the uh, press and uh, the politicians continue to use it, I mean, it, you know, it's just, maybe it's effective, but I mean, anybody can really see through uh -huh. that argument, and I think you're 100% uh, correct. Okay. We should actually use the we should actually use the term non-interventionist. That's, <laughs> like that. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite. <laughs> so, but yeah, I was uh, coming back to the interview, which we we both read a number of times, and it's interesting, you know. And I've I've seen uh, Doug, you go back and forth on Trump. Your your critique of nationalism, uh, both of your critique of nationalism, I think is spot on. Uh, this idea that somehow through some strange reason you need to be tied to this geographical soil, uh, but you have said that Trump is, uh, well, he will be our next president. You've called him an authoritarian type of figure. Uh, you've been critical. You said nothing really is going to change for the better. 
Uh, but you said it's still going to be an interesting ride and he's still better than Hillary. Considering the fact that he was uh, elected on the sort of on the back of a kind of nationalist groundswell, nation state groundswell, do you see warning flags, though, that these, these two might clash? Yeah, that, that is a potential problem. Uh, like most Americans, he tends to apathesize the U.S. military. And uh, I, I'm not a big fan of any military, quite frankly. Uh, I, I, you shouldn't be a fan of any group of people that just follow orders from the people above them. But, um, you know, this whole thing about nationalism, uh, you can take, a, you know, a, a nationalism is a negative thing, but um, some, for some reason, uh, patriotism is considered a much better thing. And, I, and I've got to say that, uh, like nationalism, it, it's just a friendly word for nationalism. It means my country is the best country in the world just because I happen to have been born there. And I don't think you should be a patriot if you were born in the Soviet Union. Uh, and I don't think you should have been a patriot if you were born in Nazi Germany at a certain time. So uh, you've got to be careful uh, right. about using these words. Yeah, you know, Doug, uh, I think uh, we're agreeing that uh, globalism is on the defense, and they've had some setbacks, and these reselections, what's going on in Europe, all shows that uh, they don't have free sailing a any longer. But uh, it seems like some people are getting much more interested in a phenomenon called cultural Marxism. And also we see a guy by the name of Soros who's very much involved here. Uh, do you see this as those individuals who are our enemies uh, recognize that they have to do something differently and they are giving up on the tanks rolling across Europe and the World War I, World War II type of problems? Uh, how, how do you see this culture of Marxism uh, playing out? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Ron, because uh, I, I think everybody but college professors in the U.S. have given up on economic Marxism as being a, a, a totally ridiculous and failed set of concepts. So they replaced it with cultural Marxism, which is dividing uh, society into classes uh, of people uh, that are naturally antagonistic to each other, at least in their minds. Uh, so it's very poisonous. Incidentally, I went to a conference in New York uh, that I was invited to. I, I'm not going to name it uh, because a business partner of mine here in Argentina was the sponsor of this thing. And they had all kinds of people. They had Soros, and they had, they had Madeline Halfbright, and they had Petraeus, <laughs> and uh, all these horrible people there. And I listened for two days to them as a guest. And all I can think of is these are parasites talking to other parasites about parasites. That's what the whole thing was about. And it's amazing to me that anybody holds these people in any kind of regard or respect at all. They're horrible people with poisonous ideas. Mm -hmm. And they certainly have their counterparts overseas. You, you, you've talked about Europe, and uh, I think Europe is actually quite an interesting place now. There are some fault lines that are developing. Of course, we saw the Brexit vote, which surprised the elites. Uh, we've got uh, a vote in Italy coming up this Sunday, uh, which is somewhat more complicated to understand, uh, but certainly there is the, the, the chance that it will further push uh, the Italians away from the EU. And then you have French presidential elections next year, which could indeed get very interesting when you have both uh, Marine Le Pen and, and Fillon uh, going against each other. Both of them have shown themselves to be hostile to Brussels, hostility to Moscow. Where do you see uh, Europe and the EU trending? Well, it's going to break up. It's, a, it's an unnatural uh, fit of, look, the real trend in the world is shown by the breakup of the Soviet Union into 15 little countries. It's shown by the breakup of Czechoslovakia into two countries, by the breakup of Yugoslavia into six countries, even Sudan broken up into two separate countries. Uh, it's going to happen to Spain. Uh, it's going to happen to England. I think Scotland is eventually going to break off from it. Uh, it might even happen here in the U.S. So the ideal situation is that we have 7 billion little nation states in the world. 
Uh, so we have more, not less. So it's a good thing. Doug, you know, with, with this reselection, a lot of people have been hopeful, and there was a populist sentiment there, and, and there are some positive things seen. But, you know, we can only estimate what might really happen over the many decades that I've been involved in trying to figure this out. I've been really influenced, you know, by the deep state, and I know you've mentioned that at times. And usually you can tell the influence of the deep states rather early, even before an administration takes part. And I have always assumed it makes no difference, you know, even with Reagan. You know, as soon as he picked his vice president, you know, I knew the ball game was over. The pro programs would, would continue. But uh, here we have uh, this information. And how much deep state influence uh, do you think there has been, uh, you know, with uh, this new administration coming in and how much there will be? And also uh, make mention about uh, where you see the CIA falling in uh, the deep state. Uh, are they still as powerful as they were when Alan Dulles ran the CIA? I think they're much more powerful because uh, all of the all of these black budgets that they have, uh, I have no doubt that many many people in the CIA have made millions of dollars taking advantage of these black budgets, and they're like a government within a government. Same with the NSA and all the rest of these things. So, uh, the CIA should be abolished. For that matter, the FBI should be abolished. The NSA should be abolished. Uh, these these are all destructive institutions, but Americans think of them now as being part of the cosmic firmament. So it's a, it's a very bad thing. And, and, and they keep growing their budget and uh, doing all kinds of propaganda to make themselves seem like they're necessary and even noble. Uh, very negative uh, influence on society, these things. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you have something? Well, I was... Just following up on, on, on your question, you know, it seems to be an institutional problem in Washington. You know, even if Donald Trump wanted to drain the swamp, as he says, yeah. and this came up in the interview, too, you've got the think tanks. The yeah. think tanks dominate policy, and they are for the status quo. So it's a... Okay, I, I do want to shift a little bit uh, over to some in, in investments in the financial markets. That's, this is where uh, Doug is, uh, you know, well known and an expert on. And and, and Nick or uh, Doug might uh, re reflect on what I'm going to, to ask about. And that is uh, the bursting of the bond bubble. You know, the bond, uh, the 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 bubble probably started back in the early '80s. That's a long time for a bond bubble for 30, for 35, 36 years. But in the last, uh, you know approximately a year, it, the 10-year bond went from uh, 1.4 to 2.4, and uh, it keeps growing. Uh, do you think we can say it has burst, it's going to be going in one direction, we're not going to see 10-year bond prices b below 2% again? And uh, also, um, you know, why was it that the expectation was that when the Fed talked about raising interest rates a quarter of a percent, the markets would get skittish and they would go down a couple hundred points. But here we see interest rates rising and the stocks are getting to uh, love this. Well, how do, you, how do you interpret that? Nick, what do you say about that? Well, in terms of the bond bubble, I mean, we're looking, uh, yeah, I agree with you. And we're looking at uh, foreigners who are buying less. And in particular, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I'm looking at Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia invests a lot of its money in U.S. Treasuries. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have kept up with what has happened over the past year with uh, Saudi Arabia. Previously, the Treasury would keep a secret, the Saudi holdings. Now they publish it. So it looks like there is a, ri a growing rift between uh, the Saudis who, who purchased uh, treasuries over, they have over 100 billion treasuries, I think, by last count, 117, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they're going to be possibly looking not only to not buy, but maybe to sell those holdings. And, and of course, you know, if there's a problem with the Chinese, the Russians have been selling. So who is going to pick up the slack and I can only see the Fed picking up the slack and even that might not stop uh, the bubble from bursting so I I am paying very close attention to uh, Saudi Arabia because I think that could really be the the pin that breaks mm -hmm. it definitively right okay uh, we'll be finishing up here soon Doug but I wanted to finish off with a, a general discussion 
on uh, just your whole philosophy because I've, I've known you for a long time and, and see if I describe you accurately. On the short term, we have a lot of problems and there's going to be a lot of bumps. But on long term, for human civilization, there's a lot of things positive. And even we talked about some of the positive things now, the breaking up of the nation state. So uh, describe that a little bit more about how bumpy is this going to be and how dangerous it is and uh, when will we have a lot more people agreeing with us that, you know, there's a lot of great things happening and there's no reason why we have to have perpetual war. To me, it's so simple. Why don't we get more people to accept one basic principle? The non-aggression principle in the world would be so much better off. I think it's a psychological problem, uh, maybe even a spiritual problem that most people suffer from. And unfortunately, most people, I don't think, think for themselves. But uh, the friend of the common man in all of this is technology. And I think Ray Kurzweil is quite correct that within 20 years, we're going to see the singularity because there are many, many areas of technology that are now advancing at the rate of Moore's law. In other words, uh, doubling in power and having in cost every 18 months. And this includes robotics. This includes uh, virtual reality, it includes uh, nanotechnology uh, above all, and these things are going to be like the printing press on steroids, and they're going to empower the average man, and uh, they'll find that they don't need the state. So I think it's going to be a natural evolution, and I'm very optimistic about that. That's the good news, and it's going to happen over the next 20 years simultaneously there is such a thing as the business cycle. And all this debt, which means that some people owe some other people, and there's so much debt that it's an unstable thing and it can't be paid. So I think we're going to have the greater depression, much worse and much different and much longer lasting than what happened in the 1930s uh, and 40s and very similar. So it, it, I guess it just depends uh, as to which end of the which end of the equation you want to look at, but uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I'm I just saying it. Right. I'd just jump in and say, yeah, I agree with both of you that on the long term, the nation state is on the way out. But I think in the more shorter term, uh, with the failure of globalism, I think the jury is still out. I think the nation state could get us. Well, looks like we've lost our connection. <laughs> we'll see. And that can be that can be very dangerous. Doug. Uh, has has a has an interesting analogy he's put once. Um, well, if the, if nationalism rises, it, you know it's kind of like when you're in the zoo and you see all the chimpanzees hooting and hollering. You don't want to be the one chimpanzee that's not hooting and hollering when the crowd gets all worked up. So it's a very dangerous time uh, to be an independent thinker, uh, libertarian uh, in in a time of rising nationalism. So I think we have to be on guard for that too. Well, and that's all the more reason. That's all the more reason to internationalize. Yes. Uh, also, that if, if the U.S. goes crazy, as Germany has, as Russia has, as China has, as Vietnam and Cuba, almost every country in the world has had a period of craziness. I mean, maybe we're going to have one in the U.S. It's possible. You know, uh, I think Mencken said something like the, the, most, the greatest danger to government is uh, a man who thinks for himself. And I want to close by saying and, uh, it was great to have the both of you on there because you do both think for yourself. And uh, we are delighted that you were with us. And uh, I, I want to thank you very much, both Doug and uh, Nick. Yeah, thank oh, Ron, you for having us, Dr. Paul. And let me, Ron, I, I can't resist. I have to say one more thing. Okay. And that's, I want to thank you for the kind endorsement that you made of my first novel, uh, first of six that are coming out called Speculator. Um, and I want to urge all our listeners to pick that up. They're going to enjoy it. And it's like carrying this conversation on in um, a story form. Wonderful. Good to see you today. And let's get back together again soon. And I want to thank our viewing audience for joining us. And I hope you enjoyed the program as much as I enjoyed participating. And please come back to the Ron Paul Liberty Report soon.
thought both of you gentlemen had a very interesting interview that you did together very recently in the International Man, I believe. And you sort of sketched out a kind of history timeline, which I found very interesting. You talked about how we began with tribes, then we moved into kingdoms, then came the nation state, which is sort of a geographic accident of birth. Uh, and then you say we're moving into a new era where we will have uh, a new sort of voluntary society that technology itself will lend itself to. Maybe if you could explain this timeline better, I think it would be very interesting. Well, let, let me speak to that, if I may. Um, yeah, that, that is the way. Those, those are the three great stages of political evolution in the world. And I'd like to believe that uh, Neil Stevenson was quite correct in his uh, absolutely stellar novel, Diamond Age, when he says that uh, the next evolution is going to be files, where people aren't loyal to some government just because they're born there, but they find their own countrymen, no matter where in the world they are, whether it's the Congo or France or Burma or the U.S., people that you share views with and philosophies with and uh, uh, see, uh, see life in the same way that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and these files uh, will become your new extended family, perhaps with millions of people. So I like to think that that's the next evolution, and it's enabled by the Internet, which is the greatest invention since Gutenberg put together movable type. Nick, you, I think with the international man, you're part of, of, what, uh, of what Mr. Casey is talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about the publication, the e That is with uh, internationalization. I want to follow up on that because I think that's a very interesting uh, distinction because, uh, you know, generally speaking, if you're against globalism, which I speak out against all the time, uh, some people interpret that, you know, at least uh, in a narrow sense, that that means protectionism and that you need to close in and it's nationalism, but they don't realize that the true uh, internationalism uh, doesn't require government, like you point out, uh, that uh, you don't need treaties, you don't need NAFTA, and you don't need the WTO, and that if you have a truly libertarian society where the borders are much more open, uh, it's, it's so different. So often in Washington, I was challenged, oh, you're an isolationist, you don't want to do this, you don't want to go to war. But, you know, it's the people who believe in globalism that are always putting on sanctions and, and looking for wars and putting pressure on them. So a lot of times, uh, you know, the people that look at this, uh, our enemies, will turn around and say, oh, you are a bunch of isolationists, and I work hard to try to s separate the two. There was a time that other libertarians used isolation isolationism as a, as a neat little term, uh, but they meant it they meant it to be a good term, but I never liked the word of isolationism to trying to define what I consider to be uh, a principle based on the non-aggression principle. But you're totally right, Dr. Paul, and it comes down to a battle of ideas. And really, it's not an honest, in my opinion, it's not an honest argument to be, to call somebody who is against globalism and isolationist. I mean, anybody who can uh, think clearly can clearly see that that's Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Co-host today is Daniel McAdams. Daniel, good to see you. Good to be with you, Dr. Paul. Good. We're going to have a very interesting program today. Oh, yeah. Two experts on internationalism, but the good kind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're not the globe. They travel the globe, but they're not globalists. <laughs> that we may talk about it. And that is uh, somebody I've known for a long time, Doug Casey. He is well known in the libertarian circles. He graduated from Georgetown, Georgetown University. I know Doug from back in the 70s and the 80s that uh, he would have some meetings up at uh, Aspen called the Aris Society, and I got to know him for there and he's also been well known for the books he's written uh, and especially for a crisis investment I think that's the name of one of his publications uh, he is known as the international man <laughs> and uh, Doug it's very nice to have you with us today well thank you Ron I'm talking to you right now from Capajate Argentina where we have a 
uh, a development that we put together some years ago. And uh, as I speak to you, since this is, especially since the election of the new president, uh, this is a relatively free country, and I'm celebrating with a Cuban cigar. Oh, great, wonderful. I also want to in, introduce an associate of yours that you work with uh, quite uh, often, and that's Nick Giabruno. Uh, he's with us today, not in the same place that you are, but I think in the same country. And Publication and what its purpose is and what role it plays. Oh, yes, absolutely. But I think first, it's important, uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, it's very important to distinguish between globalism, which is bad, and internationalism, which is not bad. And, uh, globalism simply means the centralization of power uh, into global institutions like the United Nations, NATO, uh, NAFTA, FATCA, GATCA, and these kinds of things. They're not good things. It's the centralization of power uh, on a global basis, and I think that centralization of power is always bad. Uh, internationalism, or how I would define it, is a little bit different. It's about uh, people spreading different aspects of their life uh, around different countries in the world, and the reason you would do this is not to centralize power, but to divorce yourself uh, as much as you can from uh, the politicians and bureaucrats in any particular country. So this might mean getting uh, multiple citizenships, multiple passports, and that's particularly handy because uh, any government can really revoke your passport or your citizenship basically for every, any reason they want to. Uh, so they can put you on, under house arrest. You can't travel without a passport. I don't, I don't like that we even need to travel with passports, but the uh, fact of the matter is, is if, if you're going to need them, you might as well have a lot of them so that uh, your political risk is in a sense diversified. So really internationalization and internationalism is really just about diversifying your political risk versus globalism, which is about centralization of power. So my publication uh, is actually has its roots in Doug's uh, first book, which has the same name, International Man, and uh, it's all about uh, doing exactly that and uh, removing as much political risk from your life as uh, you possibly can, and I think the best way to do. And Nick, it's good to have you with us. Uh, he's the editor of the internationalman.com. Uh, Nick, good to see you. Ah, thanks for having me, Dr. Paul. Good. Okay, Doug, um, now that you're smoking Cuban cigars and that uh, the world is living in peace uh, with Cuba once again, uh, I, I just wonder uh, whether that's a good sign that we're moving in the right direction, that internationalism of the bad kind has, has failed and the globalism is done with. And what, what are you anticipating, uh, especially with this recent election? Is the uh, nation state going to be undermined? And have we ushered in a new era that we can all sit back and enjoy uh, and smoke a cigar? Well, I wish. I wish I could say that was the case with some certainty, but um, you know, the, the whole world is continuing to go in the wrong direction with um, all their financial controls and border controls and uh, remilitarization and lots of wars and this type of thing going on. Um, so that's the bad news, but the good news is that the common man seems to be revolting uh, as evidenced by the election of Donald Trump in the U.S. and Mauricio Macri here in Argentina and uh, the fact that uh, Dilma in Brazil is, is being indicted. And, and it seems like all over Europe, the uh, non-establishment characters are uh, uh, going to win in the months to come. So I, I'm not sure what to make of it, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, was, I 